Very excited about this. We've got a great guest to join us on the show today, Coffee Zilla. Some of you might know him. He's a journalist. He's done a fantastic job over on his YouTube channel, which we'll have a link in the description, exposing crypto scams, but really being at the forefront of the SBF scandal from day one. And what a fortuitous day for you to join us, <laughs> Coffee Zilla. Thank you so much, man. We appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we've got uh, him getting arrested. It's an incredible day. For sure. Okay, so I think one of the things we wanted to start with that you could recap for the audience is when you uh, did a video, I accidentally got SBF to admit to fraud. So why don't you dig into some of the details there and maybe even take it back to what set your BS radar off with SBF from the very beginning when you started covering him many months ago? Yeah, so m months ago, he was on a podcast with uh, Matt Levine where he was saying that um, – Basically, everything's a Ponzi scheme. All of DeFi is a Ponzi scheme. It was kind of an incredible admission. And at the time, I said, look, here's this crypto CEO that everyone loves who's basically glorifying Ponzi schemes as if it's a legitimate business. And Matt Levine famous, famously said, you know, sounds like you're in, the, you're in the Ponzi business and business is good. Now, later when all of this collapsed, I tried to get an interview with him. He didn't want to talk to me, although he talked to a lot of journalists. So instead, I snuck up on a Twitter space and uh, managed to basically kind of trick him into talking to me. At first, he uh, ran away the first couple calls, but finally I nailed him down, and I got him to admit that there was fungibility between accounts. This is a really important point. Basically, Sam Bankman fried was never supposed to have control over customer funds. It was supposed to be separated per their terms of service, and what he admitted to me was that was never the case. There was what they called generalized withdrawals the day of the bankruptcy, um, the days leading up to the bankruptcy, which meant fundamentally your funds were never safe. They were always being used by Sam and Alameda to make risky trading decisions absolutely scandalous. And today you saw the results of that. Obviously you have uh, the DOJ announcing that they're about to, uh, they're about to really release their charges on him. You were very strategic about the way that you uh, went about questioning him because you had seen him very successfully dodge other interviewers who were relatively skilled um, uh, over at the New York Times and with George Stephanopoulos. Can you talk about some of the tactics that he would use to deflect scrutiny in these other interviews that he was doing? Absolutely. So what he was really good at was he was able to deflect by going to a bunch of complicated financial instruments that he knew very well. And by doing that, he could get the, the interviewer sort of off their game. So he would invoke Alameda Research, which was his trading firm, which he started, he owned but ultimately had nothing to do with, he, he, he would say he knew nothing about, right? He would say, I knew nothing about Alameda. I was not the CEO. So anything that happened there is not my fault. So an interview would, an interviewer would say, you know, what happened at FTX? It looks like there's a bunch of money stolen. And he said, well, that was with what was going on with Alameda. We had this banking issue. We had an accounting error. And each interviewer just kind of kept getting trapped in this, uh, in this, mire of excuses. So what I decided to do was really focus on FTX itself, ignore Alameda completely and say, look, even if you just take what happened on FTX, that's fraud because customers should have been backed one to one. Let's say your grandma put a Bitcoin on FTX. That money should still be there, even if they didn't have money for everyone else who is on their riskier side of uh, the trading. So they didn't have the money. He eventually admitted they didn't have the money. And that by itself is definitively fraud. You cannot tell people in your terms of service that you're going to keep their money safe and then not do it. So by focusing in on that, I was able to get around a lot of his kind of excuses of going into Alameda, going into these complicated instruments. Basically, the SEC agrees with you because they nailed him for exactly what you said in the complaint that we read on our show this morning. I want to go a little level deeper. You've been exposing kind of crypto frauds, scammers, really just online in the broader universe for quite a long time. It's something that I think that the mainstream media really misses until it just explodes into a multi-billion dollar catastrophe. Why do you think that is? Why is it that these obvious, you know, multi-billionaires in this case, multi-millionaires in many other cases, which which you've uh, exposed now for a long time. Why do they seem to fly under the radar when they're obviously so influential with younger people and on the internet writ large? I think a lot of mainstream journalists just haven't caught up with the crypto world. And I think uh, they're struggling to catch up 
even now. In the case of Sam Bankman Fried, it was a bit different because he was actually funding a lot of these institutions. You had him actually giving grants to journalists. You had him uh, working sort of hand in hand with journalists. So it's no surprise they didn't see it, right? Um, a lot of these people are still struggling to see the fraud. You have some puff pieces going out there. Don't get me wrong. There's some great mainstream pieces about Sam Bankman fried but a lot of them miss this. And the question is, okay, it's some combination of maybe they don't understand crypto, but also how much of it is, well, he was the poster child. He was the guy from Jane Street who was so smart and he was helping all the journalists. He was a huge Democratic funder. How much did that play a role in it? It's hard to know. I mean, we see this across industries, not just in terms of finance or tech, but certainly in terms of politics. A lot of times the journalists get cozy with the subjects they're supposed to be holding to account and their career depends more on access to that person than it does on, you know, potentially exposing them. And so it creates a bad incentive structure where it's like they want to be in the club rather than they really want to be covering and holding the club ultimately to account. I am curious, though, I mean, your YouTube um, channel, though your description of it is, I uncover scams, fraudsters, and fake gurus that are preying on desperate people with deceptive advertising, which is an incredible space that you've carved out for yourself. Like, what are some of the tactics that you use to, like, when does your BS radar go off? What are some of the commonalities between these various crooks that you are ultimately exposing and revealing? And what sort of characteristics does Sam Bankman Freed share with some of those other individuals you've covered? Sure. Yeah, I'd love to talk about that. Um, a lot of the tactics and methods people use to gain this like uh, status with people or grip on people. It's a lot on quick status, but I mean, a lot of these guys might be goes off whenever somebody comes out of nowhere, seemingly no pedigree, and all of a sudden is taking the world by storm. They seem to have wealth from nowhere. They advertising some get rich quick scheme. And, and really, FTX was kind of doing that. I mean, they were offering people like high interest rate loans. They said they were low risk. You have Sam Bankman fried himself, who, although he came from a great school, he came from MIT, he had some pedigree. He really didn't do much before FTX. And all of a sudden, he's the smartest guy on the block. He's telling people they have no risk. He's telling people he's got he's making money with without any kind of risk associated. It just didn't make sense. And then you just have his talk about Ponzi schemes favorably. That was a huge red flag. So it's these types of things that uh, kind of set it off. Um, with his case, I think it's just a lot of people missed it because they were blindsided by all the other rubber stamping that goes on. I mean, this is something a bit different with Sam is so many people had checked him off. You had Sequoia Capital, you have BlackRock, you have a lot of people doing so-called who are supposed to be doing due diligence who really didn't do it. But a lot of the, those same tactics that I see over and over with like deceptive marketing, predatory marketing, you saw that with SBF. And he actually admitted in an, uh, in an interview that that's actually why he talked a lot about, you know, or at least it was part of the reason he talked so much about charity, about all this effective altruism was it was part of brand building. And I think that's such an important point is what are our blind spots as an institutions, as this, uh, you know, the fourth estate, as journalists, to people like this. Who else should everybody be paying attention to? Uh, because obviously you called SBF from the beginning. Uh, are there any others that people should watch out for? I mean, certainly um, it, it's hard to say like one person without, yeah. uh, you know, making a whole story about it. But for sure, anybody who pops up out of nowhere, who claims to have the whole crypto industry on a string, has it all figured out. And we've seen this time and time again. It's usually there's undisclosed risk. So that was a big thing this year. And in crypto in general, people have been saying, oh, it's different. You can get 8% a year, no risk with crypto, or it's 8% a year is easy to get with crypto. It's different from the fiat markets. Listen, anytime anyone's promising you huge amounts of money for no risk, run. You know, if you don't understand <laughs> it, if you don't understand why there's risk associated, there's some something hidden there. And that's exactly what you've seen in the crypto industry is over and over and over again, these people who are promising high rates of return, they blow up because they had something that they were trying to hide eventually comes out. Well Some said. things are too good to be true. Would have been 
useful advice for yeah. soccer a few months Lost back. Lost 5,500 on block buy. Uh, so I'm, I'm right oh, there I'm with sorry you. to hear it. It's all right. It's all right. I'm here, I'm here to live another day. I'm here to talk to you. I should have been watching your channel more often. Uh, that's one of the reasons we wanted to have you on. Such an amazing job that you've been doing over there. I encourage everybody to go and to subscribe. You do yeah, a really absolutely. good job of both breaking it down for anybody who's just coming into it. Really entertaining. Great you know, interview style. Uh, breaking news journalism. And I, I consider you in the highest regard in this story. So congratulations. Yeah, thank, thank you. you so much. We're super grateful for your time. Thanks, guys. Appreciate you having me on. Absolutely. Yeah. Link down in the description to go ahead and subscribe to his channel. Okay, guys. Uh, thank you so much for watching. We really appreciate it. Thanks. Uh, shout out to our premium subscribers who are enabling our big expansion in 2023. We've got some stuff uh, cooking that we're going to reveal to everybody in like a little rear and review like we did last year, which is a lot of fun. We've also got another announcement, uh, which we'll tease on Thursday. Everybody will be excited. Uh, <laughs> it might sound familiar, but it is still uh, fun to say out loud regardless. Okay. I think that's it. Uh, we'll have great partner content counterpoints on Thursday and obviously we'll be here on Thursday morning. We'll see you later. Hey guys, ready or not, 2024 is fully upon us now and Sagar and I have been brainstorming ways that we can really up our game for this critical election. Yeah, we rely on our premium subs to expand our coverage, to add staff, to upgrade the studio. We just want to give you the best independent coverage of this election, which is possible. So if you can help us out, become a premium subscriber today, breakingpoints.com or the link is down here in the description video. It really means the world to us and if you like what we're all about, this is the best possible way to keep us 100% independent, working only for you.